Today, a 14-year-old boy is missing and his mum and dad need your help. Andrew went to school one morning and he's not come back. Someone, somewhere, knows where he is. And it could be you. This is Missing Live. For the next four weeks, over 100 families will be asking for your help to find just some of the 200,000 people reported missing in the UK every year. And if you've got any information on any of the cases we feature, the police and the charity Missing People are here live every day. And you really can make a difference. The family of Alex Morris thought they'd never see their brother again, but in half an hour he'll join them here in the studio. Sir Bob Geldof will also be here to explain how a new invention can help when children disappear. It's exactly the kind of technology that could have helped the parents of one schoolboy from Doncaster who's now been missing for over seven months. Kevin and Glenis Gosden are searching for their son, Andrew. Their nationwide non-stop journey to find him has meant a demanding round of radio, press and TV interviews. Andrew's only 14, but he looks even younger. He's a bright boy, good at school, but he's also very shy. He is good company. He is witty. He, he was just gentle and, and a pleasure to be around, really. You would normally find Andrew at some point, every night or every day, like this, with his Xbox thing that I can't work getting click, 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 click <laughs> on the Xbox. Uh, this is a very normal posture for him. This is Andrew's room. Um, very typical, I suppose, of, of many teenage boys. He's got his snooker table that he likes ever such a lot. And you can sort of often hear that he's around, because we can be downstairs and we'll hear him putting the balls in the table. He had, a, I would say, a small group of friends at school, um, but he didn't tend to go out. If you met him, you'd, you'd just think, what a quiet, polite, well-mannered boy. You know, he was just thoughtful and quite caring about people. Last September and the start of a new school term. We were talking about school because he had quite a few new teachers this year and so I was just asking how's Mr so-and-so and Miss so Watson aim and whatever and he was just completely normal um, you know nothing out of the ordinary at all quite relaxed Friday September the 14th and Andrew's up and out early he shot out for school in his uniform we were a little bit late getting up Kevin and Glenis go off to work. They get back home about five o'clock, expecting to find Andrew there as usual. We just made an assumption that Andrew had come in from school and was either in his room or in our converted cellar room. And we just called him for tea, and then we realised that he wasn't in the house. At first, Glenis and Kevin aren't too concerned. Finding Andrew's school uniform on the back of the chair in his bedroom, they think he must be at his friend's house. Thought, well, did he forget his key and go to our friends where the spare is and get chatting with his son? And when that turned out to be wrong, we just started getting worried. By eight o'clock that evening, Andrew's still not home. So we then got to the point of trying to contact school, and we were able to then find out that he'd never even turned up at school in the morning. As that next hour progressed, we knew something wasn't right. Um, and so we then kicked things into motion and we found the police. The search for Andrew Gosden is now a top priority for South Yorkshire Police. Andrew was uh, categorised as a, a vulnerable, uh, high-risk missing from home person due to his age and the circumstances in which he's gone missing. And uh, this incident has been treated as a major incident. Suddenly, the investigation takes an unexpected turn. 
it appears the 14-year-old has planned his disappearance. Andrew went missing, obviously, early in the morning when his parents had already left for work. And obviously, he's, he's then returned when he knows there will be no-one in at the house. He's had the opportunity to change and to collect whatever items he's needed. Later in the programme, the discovery that Andrew's bought a one-way ticket to London. He must have gone to the cash till, got a couple of hundred quid out, and um, got a train to King's Cross. CCTV confirms Andrew is in the capital, but what will police searches reveal? You were still down at the cut, down yeah, at that end of yeah. the junction, weren't you, when yeah. you've lost sight yeah. of him? Yes, that's a really worrying story. We will return to Kevin and Glenis's search for Andrew later on in the programme. Now, here to explain how a new piece of technology could have stopped Andrew going missing in the first place is Sir Bob Geldof. Morning to you. Pleasure Hi. to have you here on the programme. Um, let's just quickly talk about you as well, because you yourself have, what, slept rough. Yeah. What was that? Why did you do that? I think at a certain point, uh, young kids who were going for it, they pitch up in London and... Uh, trying to get their bearings. Mm. Um, they've nowhere to stay. And I just arrived uh, from Ireland and I don't know, 17 or 18. And uh, I used to, I slept in the street for a while, but we'd go sometimes down to Holloway. Uh, there's a, not Holloway, um, Hoburn. There's a church there, mm -hmm. sleep in the crypt. And, uh, you know, sometimes sleep out at Gatwick Airport, which was sort of Tom Hanks-like, quite cosy. But it was kind of different to running away. Uh, my dad, if I bothered contacting him, I mm. pretended I was, you know, living in B and B or something, but I wasn't. Mm. And uh, I sold hot dogs, you know, those trolleys, and sometimes spent the night in Vine Street Police Station as a result. And then I lived in a squat for about a year up in Tufnell Park. So it's beginning to work out your life and the city, which is separate to, I think, mm. possibly the parents uh, who are watching this. It wasn't fun. Um, but it wasn't too distressing because you understood it was you were young and, and these things weren't that mm. troublesome to you. Um, obviously, we've just been talking about Andrew, who went missing. He's age 14. And yeah, actually he, that's a different thing. Yeah, he didn't go to school that day. They didn't know until 5 o'clock in the evening or so that he'd gone missing. How would your technology help in that kind of situation? Well, it would immediately have alerted his parents that he hadn't arrived at school. And in his, his situation, that probably would have been puzzling to the parents, but they'd have got onto the school immediately, mm. then onto the police. And I'm not saying it would have stopped what happened, but certainly the police could have contacted the station. They may have been too late to get him on the plane, but there could have been someone at the other end to say, mm. what are you doing? And uh, it's a very, very simple piece of kit. And uh, what it does is send out, if a kid doesn't arrive at school, it automatically doesn't require the school secretary or phone calls, or it just automatically sends out a message to uh, the uh, relevant parent mm. in whatever language you like, Urdu, Slovenian, whatever, Polish, English, <coughs> that your kid isn't there. Mm. And uh, that is, ra it's used for truancy, but it can be used for any situation, it can tell you about the school, the soccer fixture has been moved, the school play is another week, here are the exam results. In my case, I thought it was perfect because it's exactly what new technology is meant to do. It's extremely cheap. It's less than a quid per pupil per year. And it saves the school money, etc. But one of my girls had started crossing London mm -hmm. uh, to go to her secondary school. And I just didn't fancy the bus on those dark winter mornings and I wanted to know that she'd arrived in school and uh, that's what said well that that fear uh, must must be present in most parents and I thought that's a good thing to do that's a good opportunity but it's also uh, a, a new thing that is bound to happen mm. with schools and at the moment it's in hundreds of schools okay very interesting it's called group call isn't it's it we'll talk call. to you again a little bit later but thanks very much and also if you've got any questions for sir bob he's going to be here all during the program this morning but or is your email working it will be working. <laughs> Missing.co. That, that'll be the day. <laughs> I'm going to give it to him again. It's missing.live at bbc.co.uk and it will be working. You can send him an email. And there's another case that needs your help. This time it's a young mother that's gone missing. Nadia Grant was staying with her mum in Stoke Newington in London. But on February the 2nd this year, she left the flat and hasn't been seen since. Nadia hasn't taken anything with her. She doesn't have a mobile and she's got no access to the money. This is Sergeant Dave Brewster from Hackney Police. Welcome. Tell us what's so 
scary about this whole case? When was Nadia last seen? Well, Nadia was living with her parents and her two young children um, with her parents uh, in Hackney. Um, following a disagreement at home, she walked out in order to call off. Um, the parents expected her to be back shortly afterwards and no one's seen or heard from her since then. So what, what's so worrying about this case then? Well, while we've got no specific information to suggest that she has come to any harm, we don't know what her state of mind was when she walked out that day. Um, and with two young children still at home being cared for by their grandparents, we would have expected some sort of contact. Of course. Well, good luck with the appeal today. Thank you. Yes, if you know anything about Nadia's disappearance, please call Hackney Police on 0207 and the number is there, it's 275 3402. Normal call charges will apply. Remember, calls from mobiles will vary. We're hoping to have more on Nadia's story later in the week and our email address is working for you as well. Now take a look at this T-shirt. Now try finding it in a crowd like this. It's a tough and time-consuming job for police, but now there's a new computer system that can automatically find that T-shirt and its owner from thousands of hours of CCTV. And we'll be putting that technology to the test later in the show. Now, if someone you know goes missing, all you long for is the day they return safe and well. But for one family, that reunion took four years. 36-year-old Alex Morris is the youngest in his family. Along with his brother and sister, he grew up in Maidenhead in Berkshire. Alex was like any normal child, boisterous, quite a handful, getting into trouble, as in like Dennis the Menace style trouble, not bad trouble. In my eyes, he was my baby brother, so, and he was the baby of the family. He was a very naughty little boy, but fun to be around. We used to go fishing, walking in the woods. We used to take the dogs for long walks. Just basic normal childhood. We were brought up in a happy family, happy environment. There were a few problems like all families have anyway, but my dad was the fun one. He was the funny one out of all of us. Alex's dad, Brian, is devoted to his three children. And his mum and dad are together for 40 years. When I first met him, he'd just come out of the RAF. And then we got married in 1967. He was a lovely man. And he loved the kids. I was very daddy's girl. Um, Alec was very close to that as well. They had their arguments. But deep down, you knew there was love there. But after a long fight with cancer, Alex's dad died six years ago. That affected Alec really, really, really bad. It, I think it broke him down. He couldn't accept that he'd lost his dad, because he, he's, he's a spitting image of my dad, as far as I'm concerned. Everything he does is as a reminder of my dad. But he always called his dad his best friend. So when his best, like a best friend died, that was it. It just went to pieces. Over the next year, Alex slowly withdraws from his family. He is clearly struggling to come to terms with the loss of his dad. It was difficult for me to know what was going on with him because I was trying to comfort my mum and grieve myself. So it was difficult to understand what he was going through. He got married and it wasn't a very happy marriage. He wasn't his happy, happy self like he used to be when we were kids. I think everything got on top of him. He couldn't deal with the situation that he'd lost his daddy, so I think he had a nervous breakdown. Alex's family is extremely worried about him. Then in December 2003, things suddenly come to a head. We phoned Alexandra just before Christmas Eve and asked if they're all coming for Christmas. And then aroused or something happened on the phone, and he said, no, I can't make it this year. Later in the programme, no one is able to make contact with Alex. The months passed on and on and on, and it got to the stage where it was like, I was worried, because I didn't know he was dead, I didn't know he was alive. And we'll return to Alex's remarkable story later in the programme. Now, this is Ruth Mulryan from Missing People, and you're here taking calls live every day, aren't you? 
We are, yeah. We've got staff at the office every day, 24-7, taking calls. And and for you saying they're taking calls, how many cases would you say you get every year? Well, there's about 210,000 reports to the police every year and at Missing People, the charity, we've got about 6,000 cases open at any one time. That's a staggering amount. And out of those people, how many would you say come home safe and well? Well, the good news and really important for viewers to hear is that within about 72 hours, most people are found or have returned. But there are still those that for days, weeks, months, their family have got no mm. news where they are. Well, fingers crossed we get lots of calls and emails today. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Time now for another appeal, this time from Cheshire Police. They are extremely concerned about the safety of John Iverson. On the evening of the 30th of January last year, he left his home near Nantwich. He hasn't been seen since. Also missing is John's Ford Transit 190 Tipper. Its registration is Q289YUX. And if you have any information on John's whereabouts, please call Cheshire Police. Their number is 0845 458 0000. Local call rates apply, but calls from mobiles will vary. Let's take you back now to a mum and dad who have had to face the horror of discovering that their young son planned his own disappearance and he's still not been found. <laughs> Andrew Gosden is from Doncaster in South Yorkshire. He's just 14. He's a bright lad, but he's also very shy. He is good company. He, he was just gentle and, and a pleasure to be around, really. On September the 14th last year, he should have been at school, but Andrew had other plans. He must have gone to the cash till, got a couple of hundred quid out, and um, got trained to King's Cross. £200 was the bulk of Andrew's savings. What was he planning? We spoke initially to the lady at the ticket office who sold Andrew the ticket. Uh, and interestingly, he, he bought a, just a single ticket when a return would have only cost 50 pence more, which possibly indicates that he wasn't intending on, on coming back home. Why has Andrew travelled to London? Officers trawl through hours of CCTV footage at King's Cross. They eventually find what they're looking for. Andrew is filmed leaving the station at 11.25 on Friday the 14th of September, the morning he went missing. From here, he simply disappears onto the streets of London. Where's he going? What does he have planned? To find Andrew in a city of seven million people is not going to be easy and the police know it. South Yorkshire police officers have travelled down to London several times, liaising with local police down there, British Transport Police, checking various council CCTV systems, speaking to as many people as possible, really. There's been a, a big you know, media campaign. Obviously, Andrew's parents have been heavily involved and we've been liaising closely with them as well. Andrew's mum and dad are doing everything they can to make sure their son is not forgotten and getting publicity is vital to their search. It varies from media and press organisations to, you know, people ringing in directly with um, possible sightings. Um, so it all needs to be dealt with. Um, you never quite know who's going to be there under the phone. OK, thanks. Bye-bye. Kevin and Glennis get a tip-off from someone in London that one of their missing posters of Andrew has a message written on it. Could Andrew have been there? They have to see for themselves. We're trying to look for the poster where apparently, so a friend of a friend said that somebody had written on they'd seen Andrew sleeping in this area a few weeks ago. Um, but we're not exactly sure where that poster was or if it will still be there. They've got these posters up in there, um, but they said none of their guys have seen anything that come in regularly. There's a second unconfirmed sighting of Andrew in a park on the South Bank near the London Assembly. There was one sighting where somebody had seen him, they thought, when they were picking up their kids from school, yeah. just walking through two or three times. Kevin goes in to ask if anyone working there has seen Andrew. 
and they took us to an information desk and they're hopefully going to be able to get it on their intranet within the offices um, so that people that are working coming and going from the building might be able to see it as well. So it's another one of those straws, perhaps, but, you know, another bit of the jigsaw, maybe. After four hours searching, Kevin and Glennis find the poster they're looking for, but it doesn't bring them any closer to their son. That's Glennis's writing. Yes. Um, yeah. I must have been given that date as some possible information of yeah. when he was seen possibly sleeping rough here. But then, obviously, something has been pi passed a month later, not known Glennis's handwriting. Yeah, and just told us that that was written on it. But it's stuck there, so that's good, cos... Yes, it's still there. I mean, in a way, perhaps that indicates that he's not possibly come back to this area. Yes. Even if it was him then. Yes. I don't know. It's been a disappointing day for Glennis and Kevin. All their leads have gone nowhere. There is, however, some positive news. Later in the programme, Glennis and Kevin make an urgent appeal on breakfast television. It results in dozens of calls. And could someone in central London have spotted their son? This is the person, I might have seen somebody looking like him with two girls right. here. When do you think day. that was? Well, let's hope that is a positive lead. Now, do you remember this T-shirt? Can you spot it in this crowd? Searching for someone in a crowd is one of the most time-consuming jobs for police when they look for a missing person. So Bob Geldof is still with us here, but we're also joined by David. Now, his company claims to have developed a system that will automatically identify someone amongst hours of CCTV footage. David, this is fascinating, but what, what is it and, and how does it work? Well, basically what it does is to produce a, a, an automatic brain behind the automatic eyes. A lot of cameras mm. are out there looking and looking and looking, great eyes, but what do they see and what do they know? Because the cameras can't actually think or interpret. Now, I think we, we, we've had some footage that you've treated. I think if we can get it up now and just tell us what's, what's happened there. We can see quite a busy street there. Yes, you went out with a camera and just took random shots of a crowd. And there's one of your staff wearing a T-shirt. A little purple box that I hope uh -huh. viewers can see round it is our technology identifying it and saying, yeah, there he is, that's the guy. And when we saw Andrew Gosden earlier on with that very distinctive T-shirt, if we could have caught him at King's Cross, we could have traced him all over town looking at CCTV footage. So this system could really be used quite, quite handy for that actual example that we Well, that we rather seen, think it we? could. We like to think of the eyes of the community in, in those CCTV cameras and worried parents and loved ones looking for somebody, but they can't look themselves. It takes a lot of police time to look. And here's a computer way of doing it for them. And how many hours, police hours, would you say that your system could potentially save? Oh, I don't want to advertise, Ralph, <laughs> but um, I, I think it could save a lot of time. So, Bob, I'm, I'm hearing we're already getting lots of uh, calls in about group call already. Yes. Um, and that's something that, that can save a lot of time as well, isn't it? Getting information out it's straight away. It's the same thing. I mean, it, it's um, a sort of technological response to something that um, is distressing. And um, these things are available now and almost at a cost-free basis. And, you know, we're in hundreds of schools at the moment. There's um, something that happened a couple of years ago, which was awful. Um, a, a, a little boy was dropped off at school by his parents between the school and the school gates. He was kidnapped yeah. and um, murdered. And um, subsequently, the authority has taken group call, not because of this, but it was one of the reasons. And I'm not saying if group call had been there, it would have prevented it. But certainly, those first few hours are the absolute key moment, once the police know. And if the school had had group call, one of the things that may have helped was that immediately the parents would have been alerted. He actually hadn't arrived at the school door. He'd left the car, but he hadn't arrived. They would have been told immediately. Mm -hmm. Presumably, they would have called the police yeah. and the police could have got those first few hours. You mentioned this critical first few hours. It is, yeah. How would um, a multicultural school deal with this? I mean, is it available in other languages? It's or just, available in all languages, and it goes out in whatever language the parent speaks nat uh, first, naturally. Um, so, yeah, again, it's very simple, very cheap. I think, in our case, it's less than a pound per really? pupil per year, yeah. So, 
how exactly does it work then, you, this, this system group call? Just, it it just, you know, in the old days you'd go in and you'd sign in, the school secretary would check it, and then when everyone was in class they'd check to see if the pupil wasn't there, then you'd make a manual phone call which costs substantial amounts of money. Mm -hmm. Now the school management system just has this software, we test it with the schools, and in fact one of the things we want to do is to test it with the missing persons charities and see if there's, we can modify it for them. They tell us what they need. So immediately okay. a kid isn't in, it just picks it up straight away and, and email, texts or emails the parents. Well, they're both fantastic systems and I wish you all the, the very best of luck with them. Remember, if you've got questions or thoughts about anything that you've seen today, please do get in touch via email. Our address again is missing.live at bbc.co.uk. We return now to the story of Alex Morris and a reunion that took four years to happen. The Morris family is from Berkshire. Born in 1972, Alex is the youngest of three. And his best friend was always his dad, Brian. But six years ago, Alex's dad suddenly died. Heartbroken, Alex begins to withdraw from the family. And after a row on the phone in 2003, he refuses to come to a family Christmas. It was about a month or two months later, my mum said she hadn't heard nothing from him. And she tried getting in touch with him. Um, she got nothing back. Um, I tried and I got no reply back. Um, so that sort of started panicking me and it started worrying my mum. I just thought he was being ignorant and not answering calls or letters or anything like that. So I just left it and got more angry and angry about it. Because I could see my mother suffering and I couldn't see how, if he says he loved his mum, that he could put his mum through that sort of pain. And it made me angry. After weeks of silence, the family finds out that Alex has moved out of his house. They call his mobile, but he doesn't answer. Although Alex is missing, his family is reluctant to waste police time. They still believe Alex will come home any day. The months passed on and on and on, and it got to the stage where it was like I was worried because I didn't know he was dead, I didn't know he was alive. It was just that, like, so your life was gone. It felt empty because you know that one of your child has gone missing. It was really hard. I tried looking for him, but I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to look for him. I don't know who to go to, and even thinking that he'd gone to my dad's grave and even leaving letters there for him to read to say that we miss him, we want him back, we love him, we just want to know he's safe and well. But it was, I think, really difficult losing my dad and then thinking that I'd lost him as well. Four years go by. There's not a word from Alex. So in January last year, Barry finally decides to contact missing people to see if they can help trace his brother. Several months went by. I had the odd phone call and I phoned them up, but nothing had happened. They hadn't found him. They said they found, might have found him, but it ended up being the wrong person. It's a disappointment from the family. But before long, missing people is in touch again. I think it was a month or something later, um, my mum said they think they found him. And I said, where? And they said they won't give the address where he is. They just know his whereabouts. and they're going to see if he's OK. Alex's family just have to wait for him to make contact. Then, last September, his mum finally gets a call. Also, my phone went and said, hello, mum. I wanted to cry, but I couldn't cry. It felt a massive relief to have my little brother back. You know, like the little kid that I remember, the running around in his nappy and running after me all the place, wanting to play with me all the time. When he finally come onto the phone, I cried my eyes out and all I kept saying to him, I thought you were dead. I said, I can't believe I can hear your voice down the phone. I had to hear his voice for real to know that it was him. There are so many unanswered questions about what has happened to Alex and where he's been. But one thing's clear. He's ready to rebuild his relationship with the people who love him.
And I'm really delighted to say, actually, that Alex is with us now, along with his sister Maggie. And it's even emotional for you, Maggie, watching that film, isn't it? Remembering Very that emotional. phone call. Yeah. How, Very. Do you, how do you feel now? If it's all a dream, I'm going to wake up and it's not real. It's just, I can't believe that we finally got him back. It's great having him in the family mm. and hearing his name again and hearing his laugh and his silly ways. It's just, it's Alex, just wonderful. How's it, how is it for you? It, it's been a, an emotional kind of roller coaster ride, really, since I've been back. But mm. a lot's happened since I've been back, you know, not just being with my family, but also being with my friends again and, um, and found a new relationship, which is just amazing. Mm. Um, I'm so kind of happy and kind of together um, because I wasn't for quite, quite a while. So, mm. But it's, it's amazing to be back and among people that you know, I know love me and I love them back and to grow up with them and, and mm. be there with them and rekindle everything is, is amazing. Yeah. Um, so what was it like? Why did you make that decision, Not given that you know now that they love you, um, not to be in touch with them, not to call them? What was that decision I, I don't, like? That wasn't a, a decision that I took, you know, light-handedly. It was mm. the, the death of my father was, you know, traumatic for me. I couldn't deal with that at all. And um, you know, being in a, in a marriage that wasn't very successful, um, also hearing a lot of rumours surrounded that the fact my family never wanted to see me again, mm. um, didn't want to know me again. Mm. Um, so that kept me away. Um, and, uh, you know, above everything else, uh, definitely the fa my father dying was, mm. was the, the worst thing. And Maggie, you're still obviously really kind of upset by the fact that he wasn't there. What about your mum? How's she now? She's a lot happier. I don't have to sit like, you used to sit there and she used to sit there and cry and think, where is he? And, mm. you know, there, there's sometimes I really did think, is he dead? Mm. Am I ever going to see my little brother again? And it was really sort of heart-wrenching to see my mum cry. And I just I can't describe words. I really can't because mm. it's just... It's amazing that I've got my little brother back in my life again. Um, you've also got nephews, which now you... Yeah. yeah. ...obviously spend time with, do you? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's given me a, a new lease of life. Um, it's made me want to have kids myself, but to spend time with him and to see mm. him again, it was very emotional. But yeah, he's a lovely little lad, and I, I really enjoy spending time with him and making up for the time that I, I believe that I lost, you know, in that period that I was away. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, he's up there now. So, what about what about other people um, who perhaps are in a similar situation to you and watching you today and aren't in contact with their family? What would you say to them? I know everybody's situation is different, but what would you say? Well, I'd, I'd say find encouragement to get in contact um, because some things might not be as bad as, as they seem. And because um, I know that parents out there love their kids no matter what. So um, I just would really encourage them to, to get in contact and, and try and rebuild what mm. they had missing for as long as they've been missing. Um, yeah, I would just definitely encourage them to do that. OK, well, really appreciate you coming to see us today, Alex and Maggie. I know your mum is, but she's upstairs waiting yeah, for you as well, yeah. isn't she? So hello to her as well. well. My okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And also just to let you know as well here on the programme that we have had a call as well about Nadia. Now, it's been seven months since Glenis and Kevin's son planned his own disappearance and he's still not come back. 14-year-old Andrew Gosden is from Doncaster in South Yorkshire. On September the 14th last year, he didn't go to school. Instead, he bought a one-way ticket and caught a train to London. A month later, his parents, Kevin and Glenis, make their own trip to the capital to follow up potential sightings. There was one sighting where somebody had seen them, they thought, when they were picking up their kids from school. But there's no news. They're about to get the chance to appeal for help live on breakfast television. Now, it's estimated that as many as 100,000 children go missing every year. Andrew Gosden is just one such boy. The pressure is starting to show. For Andrew's parents, the search seems endless. It's got a chance to stress to the public that to act immediately if they think they've seen him in the street. You do a lot of interviews and it, it's repetitive, so you start wondering which bits have I left in, if I missed out something important for information and so on. I was glad they got the helpline number on the screen at the end. I think that's really useful. So. 
What Kevin doesn't know is that back in South Yorkshire, a call has come in that could give the police a breakthrough in their investigation. We're here today because there's a, a lady saying that she's recently been around this area when she's seen a man, uh, a young man, and she thinks it could be Andrew, it matches the description of Andrew. So we're here today to speak with her, to actually get her to show us around where she's seen this, this young man. A woman working in central London thinks she saw Andrew in Covent Garden on October the 17th, a month after he went missing. What did you do? Um, I said, oh, excuse me, do you live in London? I, and then I probably said the wrong thing then by saying, oh, you just look really familiar and you look like a boy that I've seen on TV who's missing. And, um, and he said, no, it's not me. Um, and I went, oh, OK. And then he just said, um, is that, is that, is that the question you wanted to ask, or is that your only question? And um, I just went, yeah. Strange thing to on. ask that. This is their best lead so far. The woman takes the officers to the street where she thinks she saw Andrew. This is where Philip has stopped and spoke to him, and that's when she engaged him in conversation outside here. So if we make a note of this, we can see this, uh, the building itself has got CCTV cameras outside, so that's, uh, that's quite a good point for us. If they can get the footage from the office's CCTV, it could confirm it's Andrew. Um, they do have CCTV, but unfortunately it wasn't working. Without the footage, it's impossible to know if it really is him. But could other people in the area have seen Andrew? And this was as far as you got? Yeah, I did the walk OK. You were still down at the cut, down yeah, at that end of yeah. the junction, weren't you, when yeah. you've lost sight yeah. of him? Yeah. When you've lost sight of him, you've come down here and thought, well, where, where has he gone? Mm. A friend's gone inside the, pro, inside the cafe yeah. to see if he's in there, yeah. and that's the last that you saw of him. Yeah. Yeah. If Andrew's in the area, he could have visited this cafe. There's a chance someone may recognise his photograph. Have you seen this at all on the... I have TV. to say, this, this face looks familiar to me. Although it's a very typical face, typical trendy haircut. Yeah. You know, it might have been somebody looking like, mm -hmm. li like this boy, not in particular. So but if, seen... it is, it, if this is the person, I might have seen somebody looking like him with two girls right. here. Was the boy who came into the cafe with two girls Andrew? They can't be sure. And from here, the trail goes cold. We know that the last sighting, positive sighting of Andrew, was in London, but obviously what we can't confirm is that he is still there. It's now over six months since Andrew Gosden disappeared. His parents need to know what's happened to him and where he is. You go through fear, um, really, what might have happened to him. Um, you try and leave, I think, some of the worst thoughts at the back of your mind. You sort of remember the things that, that Andrew likes to do. Um, I can just picture him now, laid there, reading. Yeah, it's nice memories, nice memories. Yes, if uh, you know, have seen Andrew, you know anything about his disappearance, please call Missing People on 0500 700 700. All calls are free and confidential, but mobile charges will vary. Now, just add some information in, actually, already, that Nadia Grant has uh, had an unconfirmed sighting uh, in the Isle of Sheppey. So it's not a million miles away from where she was, uh, went missing from. Apparently she was in an amusement arcade with some friends and later on at a nightclub. So if we hear anything else, we'll obviously uh, update you on that. Now... 15-year-old Melissa Mack has been missing from her home in Northampton since the 16th of February this year. She's five foot two, uh, four tall, but she's got a brown right eye and a bluey-grey left eye, so very distinctive. And she's got straight black shoulder-length hair. Now, when she was last seen, Melissa was wearing a black parka and black jeans. Now, there's great concern for her welfare. And if you've seen Melissa or have any news regarding her, then please call Missing People. The number's there right now on your screen. 
Now, as you saw a bit earlier, Sir Bob Geldof has been working to develop a system that might help stop children disappearing. We've had a few emails about it, actually. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, this is from S. Oaks in Bolton, who says, um, with this system that you've set up, what happens if the child then walks out of school after arriving in school? Does it tell you the child has actually disappeared? It's not a tagging system, but a teacher would know if the kid doesn't show up for class mm. again, and immediately you could use group call again to alert um, your, the, the family. OK, also another one um, from Jonathan Christie and James, and this is kind of on the practical side as well. Um, they say they'd be interested in introducing the new technology in Australia. How do they go about it? Group call is... Uh, uh, beginning out in Western Australia, we have a couple of schools in New Zealand and I saw another email earlier about America and they're, mm. we're beginning to do it there too. So essentially something that started off as a truancy system which cuts truancy a lot, up to 50% in individual schools, has become something more. And just watching this today, you just can't imagine what it's like for those people. Mm. And if this helps a little bit, I'm there. And there are those heart-stopping moments as a parent as well, aren't there, when you've got little children, you turn around and suddenly they're not there. Have, have that happened to you? In the park yesterday, I was just out for a walk with the missus and there was this little fella and he wandered off and uh, lost. And you sort of panic as well, so uh, a couple of people went looking for his mum, including me, we found her. and. She'd just gone to the loo. <laughs> but you go into a panic, the whole mm. place does, and that's a light-hearted look of what these people are yeah. going through. It's, it's awful, awful. Um, and just group call generally, it's already in some schools and what you're ho hoping to sort of roll it's out It's in the hundreds system, of you? schools uh, at the moment and uh, the empirical figures, the actual proven figures in a lot of the authorities is that it's cut across the board truancy by 27% and in individual schools by 50%. Mm. So it does work, um, but it's been extended now into all sorts of areas to do with this sort of thing. And if it helps, it wasn't what we intended. Mm. It was what I had in mind when my lot started growing up and you know, crossing town and public transport. It wasn't what we set out to do, but if it helps, I'm thrilled. Yeah, absolutely. And what about other people if they want to actually get it into their schools? Is it easy to do it? Well, we, we've got a lot of local businesses sponsoring it now. I mean, there's a premiership side, no names, <laughs> we're sponsoring it for their own local schools. Yeah. And uh, so you can do that, but it's fairly cost nothing. It's about 300 quid for a primary school. So if you want it, you can go groupcall.co.uk if you want to check it out and look at what it is and speak to Lawrence and he'll drop along and stick it in your computer, whatever happens. Yeah, I, don't, whatever. I don't actually know what happens, it just, they do it. <laughs> OK, Those well, thank you very much. It. Thanks very much for coming to talk to us here this morning as You're well. Welcome. Thank you. You're thank welcome. you. Lots of people talking about it. More emails coming in now about Group Call. That's all we've got time for today. On tomorrow's programme, we'll have updates on all our appeals, plus the story of two-year-old Catrice Lee. She was in a supermarket with her parents when she just disappeared. Her family need your help to find her. Also, we have the remarkable case of a man found on the streets of Oldham. He's lost his memory and literally doesn't know who he is. Perhaps you do. Can you help him find his past? That's it for today. If you've got any information on any of the cases we've featured, please do get in touch. Yes, please do. We'll be here back tomorrow. Goodbye for now. Good